We are in our second to last week in our series on the life of Moses, the faithful servant. One of the themes that we have seen in the different episodes in the life of Moses is his role as a prophet for the nation of Israel. He has seen the glory of the Lord in different moments, whether it's going up to the mount or whether it's in moments of intercession, he sees the glory of the Lord. And we see that this looking upon the Lord of Moses is something that he is called to translate that to the people of Israel, that they might see the Lord as well. Today our passage certainly encourages us to keep our sight on the Lord, but it's actually asking us a deeper question of what we are called to look upon the Lord for. Yes, the Lord is beautiful. Yes, the Lord is glorious. But we must look upon the Lord for our salvation. Children who are here, I actually have a special job for you today in our teaching. I want you to pay attention. It's something in our text that might, for some of you, feel a little bit scary, and I bet for some of you, you're going to think it's actually really cool that it's in the Bible. But we have some snakes in our Bible story today, and one very important snake in that. And I want you children to listen. I want you to listen as we read and try to use your brains to remember another story. Somewhere else in the Bible, we'll read about a snake, because I'm going to ask for your help in a little bit. So do that for me. And now will all the people of God stand as we read God's word. Our scripture reading today comes from Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9, and the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 9 to 15. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. In John 3, verses 9 to 15, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. How do you respond to failure? If you were given the responsibility to write an autobiography of your life, how would you choose to respond to moments where you have fallen short in a significant way, even in a goal that has been one of the overarching goals of your life? For Moses, that is what this passage represents for how he would respond after his moment of failure. As we have looked at many moments in the life of Moses, and his leadership in ministry, the Exodus narrative and beyond, we come to Numbers 21, which is the passage we just read. Immediately before that, in Numbers 20, which we didn't read this morning, Moses and Aaron are found to be unfaithful to God. And this is kind of one of those life-altering episodes. Uh, It is the event where in search of water, Moses strikes the rock twice with his staff. And it's actually kind of this simple detail that might you just might fly by as you're reading the narrative. 
but in it is there, there's disobedience to God. They were not listening to what God had commanded them to do. Because of this, Moses and Aaron and most of the old generation of Israelites will not enter the promised land, which God has promised to rescue them from. God will certainly still use them, and we, obviously he's using them in the text that we read today. Um, but as Moses is writing this book, he is the author of the book of Numbers, and he includes the details of his failure, we now arrive at the next chapter to see how being guided by God's spirit, he tells us what's next. In, his, in light of his failure, he accounts the story of how yet again, Yahweh, the one true God, saves his people from themselves and the curses of their disobedience. So if we're looking for a leadership lesson here, it is the courage to recount our unfaithfulness because of the faithfulness of Yahweh to save and how good leaders never stop telling of the salvation of the Lord. Many of you might not know me or my family. We actually just came in to serve at PCPC in the, in the last year. And this is actually my first time to preach here on a Sunday morning with you all. And I thought how great of the Lord and how gracious of him to provide us this text. Um, that has the courage to be a preacher of the Lord is to be honest about our unfaithfulness in light of the faithfulness of who God is. I ask your prayers right now as open up God's word for you in this community um, for the first time. And we can look at the life of Moses together. So we'll look at three kind of points of, of the t- that kind of tie these two texts together. Um, and it's the cause, the cause of the curse that we talk about, the curse itself, and the cure. So the cause, the, the, the cause of the curse, the curse itself, and the cure. So at this point in the Israelites' journey, they've been wandering in the wilderness for 38 years. Um, we're not quite to the full 40 years yet when, they're, when they wander in into the, the, the promised land, but we're at year 38 of the wandering. And so when we see the verse today about grumbling, um, it's not really just this grumbling and complaining that happens after a stub toe. This has been a difficult trial for the nation of Israel. In the first four verses of chapter 21, which you did not read today, we hear about an extended trek for the Israelites. There were some military attacks against them by the Canaanites, and the Israelites had to sort of change their journey along the way. The Israelites are emotionally and physically exhausted. I think this is helpful for us as we read this text because we're tempted towards a sense of self-righteousness. We hear about all this grumbling of Israel, and we're like, what is their problem? (laughs) Can they not figure this out? Um, The cause of their grumbling, and thus the ultimate cause of the curse that we're reading about, was a desire for food and drink. Uh, It seems sort of simple at first, um, kind of resonating with them in their grumbling. But it was a food and drink that was different than what they wanted a food and drink that was different than what God had chosen to provide for them. We see that in verse five. The worthless food, that phrase that we see in our English Bible, are the Israelites that they're referring to is this manna that God had been providing for them. This is provided daily by the Lord, and it's enough for that day's journey and work. No more, no less, but just enough for what they needed that day. And this is what the Israelites are grumbling against. The context of all this really humbles me because I can truly see myself in the story. How many of us don't think that we have enough to get through the day? Enough energy, enough provision, enough relationships, enough hope. Grumbling can easily be a part of our own lives. But what's the big deal about grumbling? The modern mind goes to empathy an understanding for the Israelite situation. I find myself asking, why is this such a big deal to God that they're grumbling? But it is such a big deal, and we see that in the text itself. He, it's such a big deal that he sends a plague of fiery snakes as a form of judgment against the Israelites. So what, what is it? Is it just the words that the, that the Israelites are saying that are unpleasing to God? 
The sin that God is trying to address is how the Israelites have allowed their spiritual, or I'm sorry, their physical and emotional exhaustion to impact their spiritual reality. Raymond Brown, in his commentary on the book of Numbers, talks about how this exhaustion led them to anger against God about their preferable past, their gloomy future, and their frugal presence. Preferring the past here is somewhat of a blasphemous accusation against God. It's their desire to go back to Egypt. They are saying that they wish God's plan of salvation was different, that he would never have even thought to bring them out of the land of Egypt, and that he would not have made his covenant with Israel at Sinai. So while we are tempted to think from our modern minds that Israel should be just given a little bit of a break here, God, the reality from scripture is that they were not acknowledging God's power. They were not appreciating God's generosity. They did not recognize his mercy. They were not accepting his sovereignty. And they were not trusting in his word. Our stressors are different today but I think we can all easily identify ourselves as grumblers. There are two ways I see myself as a grumbler. First, I think it's in our expectation of how fast things would move. All of us are moving around so fast. It feels like our world is constantly in motion. <laughs> and we just th expect things to be there when we need them. When we are told that we must wait for something that we feel like we need, especially something that relates to daily provisions, Grumbling may even be a word that would describe us on good behavior. <laughs> it might even be far worse. I think this phrase in our English Bibles that was used to describe the sin precursor of the grumbling of the Israelites, the people became impatient on the way, could have even described your drive on the way to church today. <laughs> Why was that car driving so slow? They must not be from around here because they don't know the right lane to be in. I know these thoughts well because they're my thoughts. <laughs> we are moving so fast and we can even be on the way to good things, to things of the Lord, and we need to guard our hearts against the temptation to grow impatient. Even as we think about ministry and being involved here at church serving God, it's a godly desire. We want good things, but we can do so in a way that's impatient at the speed in which God is moving. We are tempted to question whether God is doing anything because things move slower than we want them to. Lives are not being changed fast enough. In this, I think we are grumblers. Also, I think we justify our grumbling because we impersonalize the object of our grumbling. We say to ourselves, our complaints are not against God. It's against a really hard person. And I'm justified in that because they're a hard person or it's against a really hard situation because the situation is really hard. But the text is telling us something a little bit different. We are not just growing impatient with our situation, but we are growing impatient with God. I know I excuse my impatience that way. Do you? Moses, in recounting this story of God's faithfulness to save, connects our complaints of our situation to our belief about who God is and the amazing things he has done for us. I love that we opened our worship service today singing about the great things God has shown us. It renews our hearts and our minds to remember what he has done. We too fail to acknowledge God's power, appreciate his generosity, recognize his mercy, accept his sovereignty and trust his word. Let us not grow weak in our evaluations of the seriousness of our words and the attitudes towards God in our situations. Our thoughts and our attitudes of a particular situation reveal our faith and belief in God or our lack thereof. Families and, and people of God, this is actually why Christians have historically prayed before a meal. It can seem like such a simple, almost ritualistic or rote religious task. But with the right heart, this is actually sort of a spiritual protest against our inclination to be impatient about the provision God has given us.
God, we thank you for the food before us. It's a simple phrase, but it can mean powerful things. So that's the cause of the curse. Let's look at the curse itself, the fiery snakes. The symbol God used here to represent his judgment is interesting because in the Israelites' complaint, which got them into this mess in the first place, they're grumbling, they talk about wanting to go back to Egypt. God has already judged Egypt. And even though many in their community who were witnesses to that fact have either died um, or are very old at this point in time, um, the whole community would have remembered what God did in Egypt. The Egyptian plagues, the Red Sea parting, the community would have remembered God's judgment. But even in, in the Israelites' desire to go back to Egypt, God is bringing his own unique form of a curse on them. He doesn't bring the plagues part two, but in this, it's a unique judgment against Israel in ways he had never judged the Egyptians. And the result? Israel saw many of its own die. Pain, sorrow, and mourning have become their reality. In this particular text, though, we can say that God's judgment here is gracious because it actually has helped Israel in their unbelief. And tur- they, they turn back to God and they trust him again for their way of salvation. In simple, the snakes worked. Uh, Moses says to the, Isra- or the Israelites, say to Moses in verse seven, we have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. They admit their sin, not just against the Lord, but they also confess their sin to Moses himself. They repented. They turned away from their sin, seeing the destruction it had wreaked in their community, and they turned to their high priest, Moses, to make intercession for them, to pray for them that God would heal them. They are trusting in the Lord for their salvation. It's interesting here, though, that in their trust, the text does not tell us that the fiery snakes were ever removed from Israel. In fact, verse 9 tells us that there's a continuing nature of the curse, that the cure, the bronze serpent, which we'll get to in a moment, it continues to heal those who are being bitten by the serpents. And we know that the bronze serpent remains within the people of God for another 600 years. The brokenness of grumbling is never taken away, and the curse is not either. And as we connect this to our New Testament text for today, we know that there's still a need for spiritual rebirth as it pertains to finding our salvation in God. Let's pick up the interaction with Nicodemus in the Gospel of John chapter 3. Um, I'm going to read from verses 1 to 3 right now. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So one thing that Jesus is doing is, is, as he's interpreting the story from Moses is he's saying that the, the curse continues to the time that he is ministering to Nicodemus. For if we need to be spiritually reborn, it's given that with, while the curse remains, we are left spiritually dead. As wanderers in the wilderness, we, just like the Israelites, grumble against God in our hearts and are left in need of a salvation to save us from spiritual death. Okay, children, remember how I asked you to think about where in the Bible we have heard of snakes before? I am sure, because you guys are all very smart, that some of you remember where that happened. It was in the garden, right? In the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruits, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here, God announced the curse on the snake for the first time. Now the snake was the animal which Satan, the devil, embodied when he, was tempted, when he tempted Eve to eat the fruits. And the snake was also a part of the object of God's curse that he announced. This is from Genesis chapter 3, 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock 
and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then now, here in our text for today, Moses, he's going before the Lord to pray for the Israelites and to trust God with them for their salvation. And God calls Moses to put the same cursed image on a pole that all may see the curse and need to look to it for their cure. The curse has become the cure. Two questions come to mind as we think about this. Why the snake? And has God's curse on the snake been reversed? And it becomes like sort of a special source of power for healing to us. We must conclude that the bronze serpent served as a symbol to show God's miraculous act of salvation for his people. And as Raymond Brown puts in his commentary, it says to show God's mercy, God's power, and his wisdom. God's mercy, that God didn't intend to leave his people in a state of judgment and sin, but to provide the way of escape in the wilderness showing God was the one to save, just as God promised in the garden to Adam and Eve that their offspring would crush the head of the snake, God saves the Israelites from the plague of the snakes. The Israelites knew they were turning to God through Moses to ask for help, and this was the answer from God of that prayer. The snake was the symbol God chose to remind them of this fact, of God's power. The Israelites wanted to return to Egypt in their grumbling, And the Egyptian people revered the snake for both the danger it presented, but also the protection it provided them. But Yahweh, the name of the one true God, was saying, it is my power to save you, not in Egypt, but in the wilderness at this point. And I will choose the way and means of that salvation in my own power. His wisdom. Calvin notes in his commentary, God chose something so against human reason that it would have been almost laughable for the Israelites. He chose the symbol, uh, the symbol symbol he chose was both the sign of the curse and the sign of their enemies to show that only God could have done done this. In his divine wisdom, God chose to persuade the Israelites that they were indebted solely to his divine mercy and power. Throughout history, man has been tempted to magnify the symbol rather than glorify the Lord. And in this case, it's interesting if you look at the the bronze serpent, scripture shows us an example of this to be aware of, but also a further assurance that it was never about the snake itself, but about pointing to God as the one who saves us. About 600 years later, I told you that the serpent is still with the people of Israel and there's a king, King Hezekiah, you can find this account in 2 Kings 18. And it was said in, the, in, that, in that passage that Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he began to take down places of worship of other gods all around uh, the people of Israel, including the bronze serpent, which Moses had risen up. Israel eventually actually gives this serpent a name in the days of Hezekiah. It has a, they, they, they get so accustomed to worshiping it, they name it. Nehushtan is the name, and they're actively making offerings to it. So the the same God that found it right to have Israel look at the snake to be saved is now leading a king who followed after God to tear it down. And scripture tells us that Hezekiah did this because he trusted in the Lord. This is one of the challenges that we continue to face as we strive to look to the Lord only for our salvation. We are easily tempted to take the beautiful things, the beautiful means by which God has given us for our salvation and turn them into improper worship. And this text emphasizes that the point that we already saw, which was that this was not about the symbol, the serpent, but rather about God's saving of his people. And whenever the serpent was turned to mean something else, it had to be brought down. The curse became a cure when God's righteous requirement for his people was satisfied. Let's go back to John 3, where we see Jesus interpreting the story of Moses again, and it becomes helpful at unlocking the true meaning of the text in Numbers 21. Jesus is responding to Nicodemus at nightfall, 
where he is teaching on the spiritual rebirth that happens. And he uses this account of Moses to speak of what is now going to be fulfilled in the Son of Man. Jesus spends verses 9 through 12 basically telling Nicodemus that he is not getting it yet. And perhaps you could expect an earthly teacher to just kind of leave it there and say, see you later. You haven't gotten it yet, student. But that's not what Jesus does. Verse 13 is kind of an important changing point where he moves into this wonderful proclamation of what's going to happen when the Son of Man comes. Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So now, from Jesus' interpretation, it's not Moses who is ascending on Mount Sinai and descending to be with people. It is the Son of Man who is descending from heaven and ascending to heaven. It is no longer a serpent being lifted up as a symbol of God's salvation. It's the Son of Man being lifted up, and we must look to him as a means of our salvation. Comparing the two texts, as I continue to compare the two texts, the lifter of the serpent in Numbers 21, it's easily identified as Moses. But if we want to look to the place of who the lifter is of the Son of Man, from the Gospel of John, we have to go to a different place, John 8, 28, and Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says to them, this is 8, 28 from the Gospel of John, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. The Pharisees stand in the place of Moses doing the lifting up, and Jesus is leveling all of humanity as a need of looking up in need of salvation. Not just those who recognize themselves as grumblers, but also those who see themselves as the righteous keepers of the law, like the Pharisees. All need to look to the Son of Man for their salvation. The grumbling of the Israelites, or you could even say the grumbling of the Pharisees. Also shockingly here, Jesus compares himself to a bronze serpent, the snake, which was the sign of the curse. Jesus is calling himself a curse, made to be evil. Listen, at this point in Jesus' public ministry, he's just really done some miraculous signs. He has been baptized. And this is one of the first one-to-one teaching moments in the Gospel of John. And Jesus goes out of the way to compare the Son of Man to that of a cursed snake. Paul shares this same thought with us in his epistles when he speaks of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Remember, this was all to a teacher of the law, Nicodemus, who was confused about the new birth and struggling to understand what it all meant and how it was meant to all come together. And what essentially does Jesus tell him? See and believe the Son of Man and have eternal life. See the Son of Man lifted up, not on a pole in a desert, but on a cross on the hill of Calvary. Believe that this is for you, God's chosen people, to cure us of the curse we have deserved and have eternal life. Spiritually blind people, of course, need sight to be able to see, and that is a spiritual act that we trust God for. But when their eyes are opened, are we the kind of people that are also looking to the Son of Man for our salvation? Are we the kind of community that is continually trusting God and looking to him to save us from our sins? Are we the kind of church that makes it easy to see the Son of Man raised up in how we live and how we speak and how we love? Now, as, as we kind of conclude here, I want us to think about how we should respond in worship. Uh, One of my friends, Abe Cho, he's actually a former pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian in in New York City. 
And he gave me a word picture to compare this being raised up to like Jesus. Um, do you guys remember the encyclopedias that used to show us what the anatomy of the human body looked like? And there was all those transparencies that you would stack on one another. And the first one was usually like the skeleton, and the next one was like the organs, the next one was the, the body, or the muscles, and then after that was the, the skin. And um, these diagrams would be uh, on transparency, so you could see all the different systems kind of layered on top of each other to get the full picture of what it was like, of what the human body looked like. And I think when I, we talk about this phrase, being raised up, um, we need to have kind of layers of understanding what this raised up was to get the full picture of who Jesus is and to worship him for who he truly is completely. Because we had the lifting up, we talked about the lifting up of on the cross. But the final lifting up is not actually even on a cross because that was not the last time Jesus was lifted up on earth. It was Jesus being raised to heaven to confirm that we would have eternal life with him, that he was the son of God who offered up himself for us. This is meant to convince us of his work of salvation for us, that God who is in heaven sent his son, the son of man, to descend from heaven to rescue us, to save us by taking on the curse that we deserved. And and is ascending back to heaven, showing us he is God and that we will be with him again because of the promises he has made for us. Christ becoming himself the curse that cures us. Let us pray. God, as we consider the full meaning of what it meant that your son Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, was risen up. May we see that first and foremost as you, Lord, being lifted up for us. Lifted up on the cross for our sins and lifted up to heaven that we might see the glory of who you are here on earth. God, I pray for those of us whose maybe spiritual eyes have never been opened to look upon you and to trust you for salvation. If we've never seen you in your fullness for who you are being raised up, God, may we graciously see you right now. And may we have full assurance that we are yours because of the curse that you came, became for us to cure us. God, for those of us who have looked to you for our salvation and seen you risen up before, would you continue to unite our hearts to you in Christ? Would you continue by your grace to show us who you are, high and lifted up, and that way we may have the courage to show that to each other and to our world who needs it so much. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.